In our passage this morning, we read of what is often referred to as the transfiguration, uh, the transfiguration of Christ Jesus. And while this transfiguration of the Lord isn't as centrally important uh, as Jesus' birth or His crucifixion or His resurrection, it still is an event of transcending importance within the earthly ministry of Jesus. And what you start to realize as you read through the verses that just are now before us, Matthew 17, 1 through 13, as you read through these verses, you start to realize that this transfiguration was of such towering importance for the disciples. As you read carefully through the passage, you realize that, as Matthew tells it, the transfiguration was something undertaken for the benefit of the disciples. In verse 1, Jesus leads three of His disciples, Peter, James, and John. He leads them up onto a mountain. He says He takes them apart. He's intentionally taking them away, intentionally taking them to the site of the transfiguration. In verse 2, the Scriptures say that Jesus was transformed before them. Verse 3, Moses and Elias, or Elijah, are said to appear unto them. In verse 5, the voice from the cloud of glory speaks to the disciples. In the closing verses of the passage, Jesus uses the events of the transfiguration as an opportunity to teach the disciples. Matthew very clearly wants us to know that in its impenetrable glory, the transfiguration was undertaken for the disciples. And the question that that places before us is a pretty basic one. Why? Why did the transfiguration occur? And while there may be other dimensions to it, Matthew is making very clear that the transfiguration occurred for the disciples. Why was that? Well, as we consider our passage this morning, we see that in the transfiguration, Jesus offers His people a glimpse of His glory, thereby giving them understanding, confidence, and hope. Now certainly there can be little doubt that in the transfiguration Jesus offers His people a glimpse of His glory. As you recall the events of the passage as we just have read them, Jesus takes three of His disciples, Peter, James, and John, they go up on the top of this mountain. Now doubtlessly Jesus was close with all of His disciples, but these three, Peter, James, and John, they were what you might think of as Jesus' inner circle, uh, the disciples with whom He had the closest relationship, uh, the disciples in whom He had invested most of His time and His attention. And it's this tight group of the most trusted disciples that Jesus takes with Him up into the mountain. And on that mountain, the disciples witness this almost indescribable event. According to verse 2, Jesus was transfigured before them, and His face did shine as the sun, and His raiment was white as the light. Peter, James, and John saw the glory of Jesus. And we know that when Jesus came in the flesh, His glory, His majesty, that majesty that had been His eternally, the visible radiance of God that was His, was obscured. In Philippians 2, the Apostle Paul says that Jesus made Himself of no reputation and took upon Him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now obviously Jesus never stopped being God. He never ceased to hold all of created reality together. But while He was on this earth, He didn't look like God. His glory was obscured. It was veiled. You could walk past Him in the street and He looked no different than any other man. But here, on the Mount of Transfiguration, the glory of the eternal Son of God lacerates that veil. And shining in and from and through the Jesus whom they know, the disciples see the resplendent glory of the eternal God. Now this isn't Jesus becoming for a moment something different than He is. 
This isn't Jesus for a time on the mountain changing to make some point for the disciples. No, this is Jesus being seen as He is, radiating holiness and majesty, blindingly pure, even in the garments that He wears. This is the disciples seeing the glory of Jesus, the Son of God, as the Father always saw it. They're seeing the Son as the Father saw Him, radiant in the manger, pure in His adolescence, glorious as He trod a world of squalor and of sin. For the first time, Peter, James, and John are seeing more of the fullness of who Jesus is. But that's not all that they see. In verse 3, we find out that Moses and Elijah both appear also. And they speak with Jesus. Uh, now we all, I suspect, know who Moses and Elijah are. Moses was the leader of Israel when God brought them out of Egypt. Elijah was one of the foremost prophets in Israel's history. There's much that you could say about Moses and about Elijah. But the importance of their appearance here really turns on two prophecies from the Old Testament. Now first we need to realize that while we oftentimes don't think of Moses as being a prophet, that is how the Old Testament frequently describes him. A prophet is someone who speaks from God on God's behalf. And that's precisely what Moses did. Moses was perhaps the preeminent prophet of the Old Testament. But in Deuteronomy chapter 18, as Moses' life was drawing to a close, God promised His people through Moses that in the future He would send another prophet like Moses. In Deuteronomy 18, verses 18 and 19, God said that this coming prophet would speak God's own words with an irrefutable and an unmixed authority. And from that point forward, God's people always were looking with anticipation for this coming prophet, this prophet like Moses, this prophet who would be, in fact, greater than Moses. And when Moses appeared alongside this luminous Jesus, the disciples would have seen that that long-desired prophet had come, the one to whom God's people had been looking, the one who spoke with an authority that could not be denied, the one who spoke with an authority even greater than Moses, had arrived. Now with Elijah, the weight of his appearance might actually have even been more powerful. As the Old Testament drew to a close, God had made His people a promise. Through His prophet Malachi, the last of the Old Testament prophets, in Malachi chapter 4 verse 5, God had promised His people, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now this day of the Lord refers, as we know, to the time of the Messiah. Uh, when God's long-promised Messiah would come, He would affect God's work, He would affect God's purposes in all the earth. The day of the Lord would begin when the Messiah appeared. And through Malachi, God promised His people that before His Messiah appeared, before that day, He would send someone to prepare the way. He would send another prophet. He would send specifically Elijah to be the forerunner of the Messiah. When Elijah, when Elijah appeared, He would be as a beacon signaling that the Messiah was at hand. So in our passage this morning, when the radiant Jesus stands flanked by Moses and Elijah, it's as if all of the scriptures are testifying, this is the Messiah. He's come. The promised prophet greater than Moses. The long-anticipated Messiah who would come after Elijah. He's here. He's right in front of you. He's Jesus. All that God had been saying and doing since the very dawn of time was converging on this one man, Jesus, who stood gleaming before the disciples' eyes. In verse 4 of the passage, we see that Peter, often one to blurt out something, 
Peter is so overwhelmed by the majesty of what he sees that he offers to build three different dwelling places for Jesus, for Moses, and for Elijah. But according to verse 5, while Peter was in the very act of speaking, it was as if the entire scene becomes enshrouded in a cloud. And out of that cloud there thunders a voice, a voice like that which had spoken from the midst of the cloud on top of Mount Sinai back in the book of Exodus. This is the very voice of God, the voice here of God the Father. And thundering from the lips of the Father comes this marvelous declaration in verse 5. In verse 5, speaking of Jesus, God the Father says, Behold, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear Him. Now there are ages of doctrine in that one declaration. But at its heart, there is the straightforward truth that Jesus is the beloved Son of God. Jesus isn't just a radiant man of God. He is God. And when the disciples hear this thunderous declaration, they fall, they bury their faces in the dust of the ground, knowing that they are in the presence of the God whose holiness is dangerous to sinners. But then in verse 7, Jesus comes, He touches them, and He tells them to stand up. And when they do, everything's changed. Moses and Elijah no longer are there. The cloud and the voice are gone. The veil has been lowered over Jesus' visible glory again. And He's just like they had known Him before. So in verse 9, Jesus, Peter, James, John, they all begin their descent down the mountain. As they're traveling, Jesus instructs the disciples that they are to tell no one of what they have seen until He is risen from the dead. Not even the other disciples are to know of Jesus' visible glory until they have seen it themselves in the resurrected Christ. Also, as this group is descending the mountain, the disciples have a chance to reflect on what they've seen. They evidently are a little bit confused. Having seen what they just have seen, the disciples realize that Jesus is the Messiah, but that raises a question. While these three disciples have seen Elijah briefly on the mountain, pointing to Jesus as the Messiah just as Malachi had said that he would, that appearance hadn't been at all public in the way envisioned by Malachi's prophecy. They had seen Jesus. They had seen Jesus testified to by Elijah, but no one else had. And so the disciples asked Jesus in verse 10 why it said and taught that Elijah must come first when no one else had seen Elijah on the mountain. And Jesus responds to them in verses 11 and 12 that Elijah does come first. In fact, he already had come, but he wasn't welcomed. He wasn't even understood by the Jewish people. The one who was to point to the Messiah was abused, rejected, ultimately killed. As Jesus very soberly observes at the end of verse 12, if the forerunner of the Messiah suffered, then the Messiah to whom He pointed must suffer also. And with that, the disciples' minds are given understanding. They realize that Jesus is speaking of John the Baptist. The disciples had seen Elijah on the mountain, but the Elijah of Malachi 4, 5 had come in the person of of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the promised Elijah. He pointed to, he prepared the way for Jesus the Messiah. And just as John was rejected and abused and killed, so too would Jesus suffer. And by the time you get to the end of the passage, by the time you get to the end of this account of the transfiguration, you see that the disciples have received a really disorienting amount of information. Jesus truly is the radiant Son of God. He's the long-promised Messiah whose glory darkens the sun, and yet He will suffer, He'll be abused, He'll die, then He'll raise again. Leading up to this, even in the 
chapters leading up to Matthew chapter 17, Jesus had been showing His disciples that, as the Messiah, He must suffer and die. And the disciples had had difficulty understanding that. Now, descending the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John are told again that the Messiah will suffer. But now their eyes have seen the glory of the one who will be immolated, the one who will suffer, the one who will die. The necessity of his suffering hasn't changed. But now they have more fully seen the glory of the one who will suffer. As disorienting as this vision in its full scope might be, it's clear that in the transfiguration, Jesus offers His people a glimpse of His glory. But that leaves us with our very basic question. Why? Why did Jesus disclose His glory in the transfiguration? And to answer that question, I, th I think it's perhaps helpful to follow one of these innermost disciples in the days, in the years, following the glory on the mountain. It's helpful to follow John. If it was so important to Jesus that John see His reality-bending glory, what did that vision give to John? What did it achieve in John? Well, in the first instance, John's vision on the top of the Mount of Transfiguration gave him understanding. In the transfiguration, Jesus offers His people a glimpse of His glory which will give them understanding. Now from this point forward in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus and His disciples begin heading south toward Jerusalem. And we all know what happens in Jerusalem. It's there in Jerusalem that Jesus will be arrested, He'll be tried, He'll be abused, He'll be executed. And in an unparalleled way, John would be an eyewitness to this shame of the Messiah. In John 18, verses 15 and 16, John tells us that when Jesus was arrested, when He was brought before the high priest to be falsely accused, John was with Him. He saw the man whose glory reality could not contain, placed in shackles. And then He saw Him die. In John 19, verses 26 and 27, we find that as Jesus hung on the cross, literally as the Lord of glory was hanging from the tree, John was standing there. He was in the shadow of the cross. He was beneath the cross of Jesus, as the old hymn puts it. John saw the luminous Jesus of radiant holiness become the man of darkness. The ears that had heard the Father say, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Those same ears heard that same beloved Son cry out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As John witnessed the shame, the suffering, and the death of Jesus Christ, as few others did, he would have grasped the weight of it all. It was the Son of God dying on the cross. It was God's own blood that was being poured out. Before the pitch blackness of Calvary, John had seen the blinding glory and light of the transfiguration. And he understood that the man on the cross was God. Now, standing on Calvary, John's understanding wouldn't have been perfect, of course. But as few others did, the man whose eyes had seen the glory of the transfiguration would have understood that it was the Son of God who was dying. And it was Spirit-led reflection on that truth that later would lead John to write those widely known words, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, 
but have everlasting life. In showing John the transfiguration, Jesus was preparing John to understand what was transpiring when he saw the crucifixion. He was seeing the death of the Son of God for the lives of the people of God. Now, do you see the crucifixion with that same clarity this morning? You're a seminary student, seminary professor, you know all the right jargon, you know all the right formulations, you know how to phrase things, but have you really come to terms with the fact that Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, is the eternal, all-glorious God the Son? And do you grasp what that means? It means that if you're a Christian, that in order to cleanse you from your sin, God the Son had to die. The God who radiated light on the Mount of Transfiguration had to be almost smothered in darkness because of what you have done. Not because of some abstract force, but because of what you have done. Your arrogance about your achievement, your bitterness toward those who have hurt you, the malicious, uncharitable words that you speak, the gossip that is passed off as a prayer request, the judgmental gaze that you cast upon others, the lustful wonderings of the eye, all of those sins that you're so comfortable harboring in your heart are so filthy, so vile, that the Jesus who glowed on the Mount of Transfiguration had to die in order to wash them clean. Don't be complacent with those very sins nestled in your heart, nestled in your life. Let the glory of the transfiguration make you understand the gravity of the crucifixion. Let it show you the wickedness of your sin. And then seek after holiness. Seek by the power of the Spirit to lay aside the sin that made the radiant Jesus of the transfiguration die in the darkness of Calvary. Let the transfiguration give you understanding of the crucifixion, just as it did for John. But of course, as we try quickly to trace John in the days, the years after the transfiguration, we see that it did more than just bring him understanding. In the transfiguration, Jesus offers His people a glimpse of His glory which will give them understanding and confidence. You know, we're at the start of Matthew chapter 17 this morning. Matthew chapter 16 had closed with a promise. After saying that being His disciples would necessarily bring suffering, Jesus had promised that that suffering ultimately would bring life everlasting. And as a guarantee that following Him would bring eternal life, Jesus had told His disciples that at the end of the age, He would judge all of creation. Jesus could promise eternal life because He is the judge who would give it. To put it rather crassly, suffering for Jesus was worth it because He would judge all of creation. And then in Matthew 16, verse 28, Jesus had told His disciples that some of them would not die until they saw Jesus possessing the authority, possessing the power with which He would judge all of creation. They would see the power which would guarantee that their suffering for Jesus would bring life in the end. Then, Six days later, according to verse 1 of our passage this morning, Jesus climbed the Mount of Transfiguration. John was there with Him, and he saw Jesus in His glory overcloud the sun. In the Transfiguration, Jesus was giving His disciples confidence that no matter what He suffered, no matter what they suffered for His sake, he would return and judge all of creation. 
He and His people would be vindicated. His people would receive eternal life in His presence. The disclosure of Jesus' glory in the transfiguration gave John and it gave the others confidence that Jesus would judge all things, therefore giving them confidence that whatever they suffered for His name, they didn't suffer it in vain. Now it seems to me incredibly poignant, incredibly telling that Jesus would remind John of this same truth by this same sort of vision when John was in the very midst of abject suffering for the gospel. Now, the book of Revelation, of course, is a, a record of a vision that John received while he was in exile on the island of Patmos, suffering for preaching the gospel, sent into exile because of the gospel of Jesus. And as John begins to record that vision, he begins by assuring his readers that Jesus will come in victorious judgment. All that John has received in this vision has convinced him that Jesus will judge the earth. But what has convinced this man in exile that the man for whom he is in exile will judge all things? Well, John tells us that at the very outset of the vision, he heard a voice behind him and he turned and he beheld a Jesus whose face shone as the sun, and whose garments were as white as light. Now John gives us more detail in Revelation 1, but the glorious Jesus he describes there sounds remarkably like the Jesus of the Transfiguration. And once again, that vision was bringing confidence that those who suffer for Jesus, those who are exiled for Jesus, they're suffering for the one who will judge all the earth. In his appearance at the transfiguration, Jesus was giving John and he was giving his people confidence. Confidence that on the far side of his suffering, on the far side of their suffering, Jesus would come. He would judge all of creation. And therefore, those who suffered for his sake would be given eternal life at the end. But finally... In the transfiguration, Jesus offers His people a glimpse of His glory which will give them understanding, confidence, and hope. If you have your Bibles, turn quickly to 1 John chapter 3. In 1 John, John is writing to Christians who are suffering all manner of persecution for their faith. Uh, they're facing external persecution from their enemies they're facing internal assault from false teachers who are seeking to destroy the truth of the gospel. And in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, John assures these Christians that the world attacks them because it first attacked their Savior. But then John goes on in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, to write this, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Just as they share in His suffering, so Christians share in Jesus' glory. And as few had, John had seen that glory. It's almost as if he's telling the Christians, I've seen the glory that Jesus has and that you will have. So stand firm. The glory is worth the suffering. Alone with two other disciples, John had seen the glory of Jesus, and it had given him a hope that made the worst assaults of this world powerless. G John had seen what lay on the far side of those assaults, and nothing could destroy his hope this hope of a glory like the glory that he had seen. John could persevere. He could encourage others to persevere because he had seen the very outer glimpse of what lay ahead. Now, do we have that same confidence, that same hope this morning? Confidence that the Jesus whom we worship, the Jesus whom we serve, that he one day will judge all of creation the hope that when He does, 
we shall share in His glory. If you don't have that confidence, if you don't have that hope, especially if you're entering the ministry, then you will fall. The mockery that this world heaps on those who pursue holiness, the ostracism, the exclusion that you face when you speak too often in the wrong places about Jesus, the hatred that you'll face as a servant of a hated Jesus, it will come to seem like too much and you'll choose ease in this life rather than glory in the life to come. The things of this earth, the lusts, the appetites, the desires of the body will start to seem so much more important than the things of the Spirit. And you'll pursue after things that decay rather than after things that endure. Or perhaps most commonly of all, the things of the faith, the things of Christianity will become stale, boring. They'll lose the luster of the transfigured Christ and they'll be devalued in your heart in favor of something new, something that seems to promise so much more than this tired old religion. If you're to stand firm in your faith through the trials, the mockery of this life, if you're to stand firm through the numbing regularity of your days, you have to have the resolve to serve selflessly in a small church increasingly at the margins of society. If we're to do these things, we must have the confidence and the hope instilled by the transfiguration. Jesus will judge all of creation. And the suffering that you bear for Him, you're bearing to glory. And in that great day when Jesus will judge, His people shall shine with the glory of their Savior. This is the confidence, the hope that John received from the transfiguration. And it's the confidence and the hope that we need this morning as well. To find that confidence, to find that hope, to find that understanding that Jesus was giving to His people in the, transfigura excuse me, in the transfiguration, you must give yourself to the Word of God. Now, we don't have the time to explore this almost unbelievable truth. But in 2 Peter 1, verses 16 through 21, the Apostle Peter, himself also a witness of the transfiguration, Peter declares that as marvelous as that revelation was, as marvelous as the revelation of the transfiguration was, we have a better revelation. We have what Peter calls a more sure word of prophecy in the Scriptures. You have in the Bible in front of you a word even more glorious, even more sure than the impenetrable glory of the transfiguration. Devour that word. Find therein understanding, confidence, hope, all of it rooted in the all-glorious Jesus who is revealed in the words of that Scripture. Now, brothers, as you're laboring here in seminary, the thing that you need, the thing that you must be pursuing is a better sight of Jesus, a better knowledge of who He is, a better knowledge of what He's done, a, a tighter hold on Jesus. And then when you enter the wheat fields and Satan buffets you and he seeks to sift you, you'll only see Jesus you'll know that the one who holds all of created reality in the deep of his hand, he died to make you clean, and he'll preserve you till the end. And he'll even use the afflictions to purify and to perfect the one whom he has purchased with his own radiant blood. In the transfiguration, Jesus offers his people a glimpse of his glory thereby giving them understanding, confidence, and hope. Now, of course, this morning we can't climb the same mountain, but we can see that same glorious Son of God. We see Him by God's Spirit in the Scriptures. And we can find in those Scriptures, by God's Spirit, understanding of our sin, 
understanding of Jesus' glory, confidence to suffer humiliation for the Jesus who will judge all of creation, and hope that what we are now will be dissolved by the glory of what we will become. May God be pleased to show us the glory of Jesus in His Word and give us the understanding, the confidence, and the hope that we need to live as His disciples, His servants, in the midst of a dark world. Amen. Let's pray. Our great God and Father in heaven, we rejoice this morning in the indescribable, unsearchable depths of the glory of the Lord Jesus. He whom is the Redeemer of His people. We confess, O Lord, that we seek after so many things uh, that even here in seminary, whether as students or professors or faculty, that we seek after knowledge of so many things, so many good things. Uh, we ask, O oh Lord, that in all of our labors that Thou wouldst be making us to see Jesus more clearly, uh, to come to see His glory and to be shaped by that glory, to live lives that are conformed to it, that seek after it, that value it, that are comforted by it. We ask, O oh Lord, that Thou wouldst be with each of us in the various uh, ministries that we currently have and the ministries to which Thou wilt call us in days to come. In all of our labors, O Lord, make the Lord Jesus preeminent in our hearts and in our minds and enable us by the grace of Thy Spirit to show that same glory of that same Jesus to the world around us and to His people and to those who shall be made His people by the power of Thy Spirit. Lord, we give Thee thanks for Thy Word, and pray that Thou wouldst bless it to us. We ask it all in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.